to the Gospel of Matthew. We want to read a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning as we look at the dynamics for the success of the church. If you find that passage beginning in verse 13 of that 16th chapter, would you stand in honor of the Word of God as I read and as you follow along? When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, son of Elias, and others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged to his disciples that they should tell no man that he was the Christ. Father, we thank you this morning for an opportunity just to stand and to open your holy word. And Lord, to read from its pages and to glean, Father, from its message. I pray, Heavenly Father, today that we would be workmen that rightly divide the word of truth. And as we stand in the marketplace tomorrow, Remembering this word, applying it to our lives, that we would have no need of shame. Father, I thank you for uh, all that it teaches us, and I pray now as we, as we learn from it that we might apply that which it has to say to our lives. And Father, we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for, for our asking and praying in Jesus' name, and for his sake I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. In a survey that was taken a while ago, the question was asked, what is your favorite word? Now, as you can assume, and as we all can assume, there were uh, lots of different answers. But one of the things that amazed the surveyors was that among the most prevalent and prominent answers was the word success. It seems like that everybody wants to be a success. And that's a good trait, isn't it? We all want our children to succeed, our grandchildren to succeed. We all want to succeed in the business world and, and in the, the financial realm of life. We want to succeed in, in the community in which we live. We want to be a success. We don't want to be the sore thumb that sticks out. In every area of life, that word is an important word. I want to talk about this morning, I want us to think about from the word of God this morning, the success of an, of an entity which cannot afford to fail. It cannot afford to fail. I read not long ago a statement that I at first had a problem agreeing with. But then the more I thought about that statement, the more I became in agreement with it. This is a statement that I read. The ultimate success of our world depends largely upon the success of the church. Now I know that there are those who would argue that uh, well, church only goes on just a, a few hours in the week, and, and, and children and people are at home and in the workaday world for so many more hours and, and are subject to so many more uh, influences in those hours than are they as they come and sit in the church. But more so as I think about that statement, I realize the truthfulness of that statement that the success of our world depends largely upon the success of the church. I know this. I know that the scriptures teach us without a doubt 
that Jesus put much stock in the success of the church. He wanted it to succeed. He wants it to succeed even today. Now, I also recognize, and I'm sure that you recognize, that by no stretch of the imagination this morning is that an automatic experience. It doesn't just happen. We cannot just blink our, church, our eyes. We cannot just hope in our heart. We cannot just think in our mind. There has to go into the success of the church so many, many things. Churches rise and fall. Every day. You hear of a church that begins. And then you'll hear of a church that, that seems like it's in the, the death throes of, uh, of its life and its ministry. But I believe with all of my heart that the Bible teaches us from this passage that the church can succeed. If it has the right dynamics, if it has that which it takes to succeed, it will be a success. Because you see, the church, the principle of the church, as purported here by Jesus, is built on some solid foundational principles. I don't think there's a better place to look at the, at the, the dynamics of the, of the church being the success that God wants it to be than in this passage where Jesus proposed to those disciples and to those round about and even to us today the establishment of the New Testament church as we know it today. Now, the church has existed for a long, long time. In the Old Testament, it was known as the synagogue. And it was built as a, a primary function place to come and to worship God and to meet with God and to fellowship with God. Today, the church still stands for that. And I want us to look at some things this morning. I want us to notice some precepts that I believe Jesus sets forth as the dynamics of a successful church. The first one that I want you to notice is that Jesus says a successful church will be built on the wisdom of God. Built on the wisdom of God. You know, it amazes me today what churches are built on. One of the burdens of my heart and I'll just share this from my heart, Diane, and I talk about this uh, lots of times, is people who just split off from the church for some reason that really is not a valid reason to, to split off from the church. I believe Jesus teaches that the church is built by multiplication. That's the principle that he sets forth here. It's not built by and established by division. It has to be built on his wisdom, on his way, on his will for that church. Now listen to what God has to say about his wisdom. What is the wisdom that God uses to build the church? I think we can say it in one word this morning. And I want you to recognize that, and that word is faith. Jesus said to Simon Peter, and not only to Simon Peter, Understand, he was not just talking to one person, but he was talking to a group of people to whom he would entrust the most powerful entity that the world has ever known. And this is what he said, upon this rock, upon this rock. Now go back and think about the rock that he was referring to. He wasn't talking about the shoulders of one man. Some have accredited Peter with being the father, the founding father of the modern day church. I disagree with that because I do not believe that the church can rest on one man's shoulders, nor does God intend for it to rest upon all of our shoulders as men. He had a deeper meaning, I believe, there as we look in that passage of Scripture when he said, upon this rock, upon a faith like this, I will build my church. The question is asked. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say? And that's a question this morning, my friend, that is pertinent to the success of Edwards Chapel Baptist Church or any church anywhere. God used what Peter knew to establish a mighty work that would last down through the world 
down through the ages and is still unequaled in the world today. Let me just ask you to be personal for a moment and to think about our church. Why are we here? What happened to bring us together to this place? I believe one day God saw a group of people. God saw a group of people who knew who he was. They knew what he was about. They understood that he had a purpose and a plan for this part of the world. And so they allowed him to work in their life and, and, and work his wisdom out in their life and, and work his way out in their life that this place would be here and stand on this hillside now for a for hundred plus years that we would, we would have that opportunity. You see, it was through their faith. It was through their understanding. It was through their, their love. It was through God's wisdom. God saw it all, and he put it together and put it into place in this, in this place. And my friend, I want to tell you something. I hope we realize that it will only stand as long as God sees that same faith in our generation today. We cannot rest on the laurels of our ancestors. We cannot rest on the laurels of our founding fathers. We have to have that same faith if the church is to succeed. And God will bless that same faith in the very same way that he blessed it in the faith of the founding fathers of Edwards Chapel Baptist Church. He will bless it in the same way that he blessed it as he saw it in the faith of Peter and those disciples who were sitting there round about him, there by the seaside, who, upon whom he cast the mantle of the church. So understand the dynamic of the power of the church is the wisdom of God. It's not what we want. It's not what we can see. It's not what we think, but it's what God wants and what God can see in us. Because you see, not only is the dynamic of the church built upon the wisdom of God, but it's also uh, a church that will be burdened for the work of God. There are all kinds of efforts and emphasis that plague the church today. And I want to explain that. I say the word plague because I believe there are two reasons that the church is so plagued today. The first reason is that because these things take away from the real emphases of the church. They rob us of understanding and doing what God asks us to do. The second may be as more or, or more dangerous because, you see, they serve to lull us into a complacency that says, well, we're doing something for God. We're carrying on some kind of work for God, and we don't need to go any farther or do any more. All of us know that around us are all kinds of influence, and somehow Satan has done a masterful job. I mean a masterful job in convincing the church that it needs to yield to everything and everyone and every wind that comes along. And somehow the church becomes swayed in every direction. Now we need to stop this morning and as it was Chapel Baptist Church, think about the work of God in this place. What does God want to do in this place? What is his work here? I believe in other things, don't get me wrong, but they all have to center in on the work of God. I've often said we used to have a, a softball team at Black's Creek, and it was a wonderful ministry. But I'd tell those guys as they'd go out to play softball, I'd say to them, if God can use a softball bat to bring somebody to Jesus, okay. But if you're going out to play softball, don't go in the name of the church. Just play softball. I believe in that. But I believe this morning we need to focus in 
on the work that God sets forth for the church. Two things that Jesus says. First of all, he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, I know that a lot of people, when they see that, they envision a church building. They envision an organization whereby God could use to reach people. They envision the, the, the structure of the church that we have become so familiar with today. Let me let you in on a little clue, folks. That day, there were no churches with steeples. That day, there were no Sunday schools. That day, there, were, there, there was nothing that we can imagine as the church today. So what in the world could Jesus have meant when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church? I believe he was saying, I'm going to invest in you a process that will help you to reveal the will of God to the world round about you. That's the purpose of the church. And I found out really early, you don't even have to have a building to do that. Go to most of the world today where people are meeting, some of them just sitting on a riverbank, some of them sitting under a straw thatched hut, some of them sitting out in the open, but they're growing they're growing in the word and the will of God. You see, it doesn't take the things that we think about as a church. I'm grateful for them. I'm glad that we can come in a beautiful place to come. But let's understand, that's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't saying, build me a big edifice, build me a nice looking church, put a tall steeple on it, and call it the church. He was saying, be a group of people who are burdened for my work. Be a group of people who are willing to reach out into my community. Be a, a group of church who are willing to live out every day the principles that I set forth in your life as you come together and as you fellowship in the church. Like Mac was talking about this morning, so we won't have a spiritual drought in our land and in our church. But not only did Jesus say, I will build my church, he said, I will guard it against Satan. I will guard it against Satan. I believe the purpose of the church, one of our purposes, is to guard against the satanic invasion of our world. How many of you would agree this morning that Satan is alive and well in Athens, Georgia? He is alive and well. He's never prospered any more than he's prospering right now. Defeated foes, but he seems to be prospering. Let me tell you something, folks. There's only one voice that will ever speak against him in this world. And that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are God's voice against Satan in this world. We are God's voice against Satan in Athens, Georgia. You see, the success of the church depends upon the burden that it has for the work of God. Are we willing to do the work of God? Are we willing to do what God tells us to do every single moment of every single day of our lives? Or are we satisfied just to come and sit on Sunday morning, some on Sunday night, some on Wednesday night, and call it church for a week? Folks, our world is hurting tonight, today. Our world is crying today. Our world is, is going down the tubes today. And it may be because we are not burdened for the work of God. It may be because we have decided that all we need to do is just come together and meet. You see, a successful church, not only is one who's built on the wisdom of God, not only is one who's burdened for the work of God, but a successful church, according to Jesus, is one who brings the world and the will of God together. Hear me well. One who brings the word of God, the will of God, and the world together. We have lost, in our day and age, one of the grandest principles of life that we've ever known. And that is the principle 
of sharing the word and the wisdom of God. The generation that's coming on, for the most part, now I know not everybody, but for the most part sees no need in sharing the word and the will of God. Parents don't see a need in sitting down with their children and reading and talking about the Word of God. Folks don't see a need for a personal devotion time to just get along with God by yourself and talk with Him and let Him talk with you and let Him help you to understand His Word. Not many homes today have a family altar. Not many folks can say that there's a place in their house where they come together for the sole purpose of worshiping and sharing the good news of the word. Not many people today are prone to praying, whether it's in public or in private. The truth of the matter is we are a people who really have no or little time for the kingdom. It seems like it has no influence on the lives of most of the world today. Now, I know that there's a lot of finger pointing that goes on in that area. I know that we look at the world and we say to them, why in the world, don't you? We understand you need to do that. You ought to do that. The hope of the world is, is on that. But I want to suggest to you this morning that maybe the fault for this doesn't lie in the world. Maybe the fault for this lies in the church. Have we failed? Have we failed? Look at what Jesus said to the church. And in all the scriptures, I don't find that he said this to anybody else or to any group other than the church. He said, you have the keys. Most of us have a set of keys in our pocket. And we understand what that key will do. That key will do one of two things. It will open that, which is locked. Or it will lock that, which is open. It doesn't matter whether it's our house, whether it's our car, whether it's our office key. Whatever it might be, those are the two functions of any key. They don't do anything else. Now, what did Jesus mean? He said, I have entrusted something to you. I have entrusted something to you. He didn't say to the world, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you unlock it. He said to that group of guys there, and he says to us this morning, he said, I have entrusted something to to you. Something that the world doesn't have time for. Something that the world doesn't care anything it seems like about this morning. He said, I've given it to you. It's in your hand. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. It's that you're keeping, you're, you're keeping from day unto day. And you know, he said this, if you don't unlock it, it won't be unlocked. If you don't unlock it, if you don't bind it up on earth, if you don't share it on earth, then there are a lot of folks that are going to miss out in the joy of heaven. And if you don't stand up for that which is wrong and bind it on earth and lock it away, then it will be loose there in heaven. What is Jesus really saying? He's saying to you and me, we have the ultimate control. We have the opportunity of a lifetime. We have the opportunity to bring life into our community and into our world. Now the question is this. What good is that opportunity when for the most part it remains locked up behind church house doors? What good is it that God has entrusted that which will change our world when about as far as it goes is the back door 
of the church. Folks, the church will never succeed unless we're willing to bring the world and the church and the will of God together. I want to say to you, it can't be any longer me, my four, and no more. I am certain, I am absolutely certain that with a philosophy like that, with a desire like that, the church, whether it be Edwards Chapel, whether it be any other church, is on a road destined to failure. You see, we have a job to do. Jesus said this, I tr entrusted it to you. It's yours. It's yours. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to loose it and let it go, unlock it so the world can enjoy it and be blessed by it? Are you going to bind it up? Are you going to bind it up so nobody, so nobody can know, nobody can enjoy, but just those few who are willing to come into my house? You see, the church will be successful, folks, when it's built on the wisdom of God, when it's burdened for the work of God, and when it blesses the world by bringing the world and the will of God for that world together. We live in a changing world. There's no doubt in my mind that the world will be different tomorrow than it was today. There's no doubt in my mind, it's very obvious, that it's different today than it was yesterday. We need to have a computer mentality in more than just computers. You know, yesterday's Electronics are, are now junk. Today's are on the horizon. That should be the philosophy of the church. Are we doing, are we doing at Edwards Chapel what we have to do for the church to be a success? It would be really nice. I was thinking about sitting in the office this morning studying this passage. I was thinking about some of those who have gone on before. Some of them I can put names to. Many of them I can't. Many of you can put names to them because they've been a blessing to your heart and a blessing to your life. They were the fabric upon which this church was founded. God saw in them a faith that it could use to build a church here at Edwards Chapel Baptist Church. And I would say with all my heart, without any reservation, they succeeded. The church was a success when it was upon their shoulders. But they no longer graced these pews. They no longer filled that spot on Sunday morning. They no longer go out into the world on Monday and represent well the cause of the kingdom. Now, you and I fill the pews. Now we go out on Monday. Do we well represent the cause of Christ? It is built into the fabric of our life. The faith that God can use to not only establish, but to keep his church here at Edwards Chapel. I want our church to succeed. I know that you want it to succeed. I pray that we'll be willing this morning to commit to God to those dynamics that will cause it to succeed in the days that are here. Father, I thank you this morning for the church here at Edwards Chapel. Lord, I thank you that for many, many, many years a church has been here. Not only a building, Lord. I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about a people. A people who one day got together and began to long for a place to worship and a time to worship. 
and who look to you in faith believing that you wanted them to worship, that you wanted them to share your word and your will, that you wanted them to stand against Satan, that you wanted them to go out into this community and bring the people and your word and your will together. Lord, I thank you for a church like that. And Father, I thank you that upon that desire you could build a church here at Edwards Chapel. Lord, I thank you for the efforts that they made. The time that was spent, Lord. Lord, we see the fruit of that effort even this morning as we sit here on many parts. But now, Lord, we realize that they're at home in glory. We realize, Father, that they're receiving their eternal reward of faithfulness. I pray this morning that you, as you look at us here at Edwards Chapel, you would find a church, a group of people who want and who have that faith in which you can work, with which you can work, to establish a strong church, a successful church. I pray this morning, God, you'll find a people here who are burdened for your work, who want to do the very thing that you ask of us 